Hello and welcome to the EIS video series Taking Action on Gender-Based Violence. My name is Selma Augustad, I'm the National Officer for Equality at the EIS and today I'm speaking to Jody McVick. Jody is Scottish Women's Aid National Training Coordinator, having previously worked in Women's Aid Refuges and having served as a board member providing governance to Women's Aid groups. Jodi designs and delivers bespoke domestic abuse training nationally, both digitally and in person, and is also a certified Safe and Together trainer. She has a great interest in equalities, having campaigned, consulted on and supported implementation <clears throat> of various equalities legislation over the last 15 years, with eradicating domestic abuse and the impact it has on women children as a passion she's highlighted throughout this time. Thanks so much for being here, Jodie. It would be great to hear from you. Hi, thank you for the introduction there. Yes, yeah, so my name is Jodie McVicker and I work with Scottish Women's Aid as a National Training Coordinator. So we are really trying to emphasise the impact of coercive control on children and young people as well as adult survivors. So I'm going to get my presentation up and just talk a little bit today about what that looks like, what the impacts are and as teachers what you can do to support children and young people experiencing this. So I always like to ground our training in the, the, the voices of children and young people when we are talking about the impacts on them. So um, what we have here is a picture that was drawn during an art therapy project with um, children and young people at South Ayrshire Women's Aid. I think this is a really important one because what it really does is portray how domestic abuse does impact on children and how children um, themselves can develop very complex coping strategies and make complex decisions about who they talk to, about what's happening for them, how they talk about it, and also decisions they make on not talking about it. So we can see here that this child obviously has understood that um, she has a different persona at school with professionals than she does at home. And for me, that's about asking the right questions to try and kind of look beneath the surface about what's going on for children and young people that we're working with. So in terms of um, domestic abuse, at Scottish Women's Aid, we work from what we call a gendered analysis of domestic abuse. Um, so what that means is we absolutely acknowledge that domestic abuse can happen in any relationship dynamic, whether that's a heterosexual one, um, a same-sex relationship, it can happen with male perpetrators and female per perpetrators. In every case of domestic abuse should be taken seriously and all victims should be given access to appropriate support. We also know that overwhelmingly the most common dynamic is male perpetrators and female survivors. And also the way that domestic abuse plays out in relationships, the tactics that are used, they're very different. So we know that men and women can both experience incidents of domestic abuse. However, women are far more likely to have experienced repeated and severe forms of abuse. And they're also more likely to have um, experienced sustained physical, emotional and physical abuse. And they're more likely to um, have to be subject to serious assault and death. So when we look at what we call domestic homicide figures, the vast majority of those are female victims and male, male perpetrators. And also when we think about the differences between male violence and female violence and abuse, there's a big difference there in terms of the tactics. So as well as that severity and um, the commonality of it in terms of how often it happens. There's also tactics within domestic abuse which are very gendered. We find that perpetrators of domestic abuse are very rooted in kind of old-fashioned ideas about gender, what the roles are within relationships. So they'll have very fixed ideas about what a male role is in a relationship and what a female role is in a relationship. And the way that will play out is that they will look to um, put that opinion on the other person and have them adapt their behaviour accordingly. So in terms of gender, we know that it impacts on the risk to the survivor, um, the, the gender of the perpetrator, and we also know that um, how we can then offer support is different. So for women, it's really important that um, we have things like refugees, that we have outreach. Um, for men, the, the abuse tends to be more emotional and psychological. So it would be thinking about therapies um, and self-esteem and value work. 
So I just wanted to talk very quickly about some societal attitudes and misconceptions about domestic abuse because I think this is really important to talk about. So we have kind of what we call minimisation narratives around domestic abuse. So things like it's caused by poverty, alcohol, stress, old firm games or coronavirus restrictions. It's really important that we understand that actually there's no evidence of this and the evidence shows the, the opposite. We do know that incidents of domestic abuse can spike in old firm games and we know that domestic abuse has the tactics have escalated over lockdown restrictions, but those relationships would have had domestic abuse in them anyway. There would have been some element of control in those relationships all the time, every day. So we know that domestic abuse, coercive control, it's a pattern of behaviour. So things like old firm games and coronavirus restrictions might cause that person's tactics to escalate, but they would already have been a controlling person that's causing fear and alarm to the person in that relationship already. And we also know that poverty, alcohol, stress, these are not causal factors. We know that it's not incident based, as I said, it's a, a pattern of behaviour. It's really important that we can identify it as a pattern of behaviour because we put women and children at greater risk when we don't see it that way. Um, we tended to look at um, domestic abuse as something that was physical violence focused, but now, especially with the new domestic abuse legislation, we have been able to criminalise that non-physical abuse. And we understand from what the work that we do with women and children that that's the hardest part for them to recover from. I think really importantly for yourselves as teachers, it's important to can understand about this misconception that children um, are witnesses and not victims. So we absolutely know that children don't witness domestic abuse, they experience domestic abuse, they experience it and they're impacted by it in a very profound way, um, similar to adult survivors. We can work with that and children can absolutely heal and recover from that, um, but we have to understand that that impacts there in the first place. And also that sense of like mothers that stay aren't providing safety. We know that actually sometimes it's safer to stay in the relationship than to leave because of that escalation of risk on leaving. And also as professionals trying to not be more cautious where we think that religion or culture might be an issue. We know that there's no religion or culture that advocates domestic abuse and excuses it. So we should always be asking questions when we think that this is an issue. So just in terms of thinking about how does domestic abuse impact on children and young people, um, if like we might think, oh, well, they might not see it, they might not know what's happening, but children absolutely know what's happening in the house. Even if they're not directly witnessing it, they will be impacted by what's going on in that house. Uh, and it's highly unlikely that the perpetrators aren't in some way focusing on the children. Um, Emma Katz is an amazing researcher who's done a lot of work on children um, and young people's impacts of domestic abuse. Um, and she came up with this kind of statement, domestic abuse is a parent and choice, um, because we know that where there's impacts on the, 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 the adult survivor, there's absolutely going to be impacts on the child too. And I'll talk about some of those in a wee moment. But also it's important, I think, to look at this statistic here about significant case reviews in Scotland. So um, a study was done over a three year period between 2012 and 2015, which showed that almost two thirds of children and young people um, that ended up having a significant case review because of what had happened to them had been living with domestic abuse. And when we look at children going through like the children's hearing system, a, a huge percentage of those children are living with domestic abuse, whether or not that's been the grounds for referral to the, the panel. So then in terms of coercive control, this term was coined by someone called Evan Stark. Um, it had been used way before Evan Stark talked about coercive control, but he really um, managed to do a lot of research that pointed <clears throat> to the fact that what coercive control came down to was this micro-regulation of everyday behaviours. And it was very tied to this stereotypical idea of how women perform in relationships, how they perform in society, how they care for children and their sexual role. Um, and this manages to gain traction in society because we, are, we have gender roles like everywhere. We have this binary of what, gen, what how people should perform in terms of gender. What coercive control looks like um, in terms of relationships. Um, so we might see um, the, the perpetrator isolating the survivor from their support network. Often this won't be a direct, I don't want you to see these people. Often they will just make it so difficult and unpleasant for the survivor to see these people that the survivor themselves will make the choice. And that's very complex. 
um, think about um, controlling time and resources. This is absolutely something that impacts on the children too. Monitoring of activities and movements, again, directly impacts on children. Um, threats of harm to the adult survivor, child survivor or pets. We know that this is a very common perpetrator tactic, whether it's threatening to take the children away, threatening to talk to social services about the adult survivor. And this then pitches services that could potentially help them as the enemy, which is, again, a really complex dynamic. Um, they may damage the person's possessions and the children's possessions and home environment. There may be jealousy there um, around contact with family members, contact with friends, it might be sexual jealousy. And we also see levels of sexual coercion there as well. So demands on how often the person has sex, the type of sex they have, just not feeling in control of that. It's also really important to say that coercive control, these things are now a crime. Um, the Domestic Abuse Scotland Act has been live since April last year, and there has been many successful prosecutions under this legislation. So again, going back to, to children's voices here, this is a 10 year old who had written this, who um, designed this graphic about their experiences and really get a sense of that person feeling really kind of downtrodden, trapped in that situation. And this one for me is really um, quite um, important to think about in terms of how that impact is on children, because we see here all of the ways that are really important for children to be able to develop their sense of self, their sense of independence, their sense of autonomy, be able to make choices, have creative play. This is absolutely curtailed for this child. So they know that um, the perpetrator in their household is angry when children run about, when they're around, when they turn the TV on, when they leave toys on the floor. Um, leave trainers on the floor. So this child's life feels very controlled and restricted and that will have a massive impact. So in terms of some of those impacts, so children will have the impacts of that trauma. So common things that as teachers you will see, things like being tired, not coming to school, the physical impact of trauma, feeling sick, headaches, fatigue. But they'll also take on certain roles due to that relation, the, the dynamic within the house. So they might internalise shame and blame. That's very common in child and adult survivors of domestic abuse. They may be forced to act as a caretaker. Um, they may be keeping secrets, which is a big impact. They may be scapegoated. They may be targeted, and that could be by either of the couple. We know that um, with um, pregnancy, it's a big um, escalation of risk. So we, when women get pregnant, tactics tend to escalate. Um, the child may become the mother's confidant. So we see that in children who just know too much. They're little, little mini adults and they know everything about the relationship. They might become the abuser's confidant because again, children and the, the, or the abuser's ally, children make very complex decisions on how to keep themselves safe. And sometimes, for the child, it will actually be safer to ally with the abuser. And again, that will have very complex repercussions on how they feel about themselves and how we help them heal and move on. And again, like the perfect child, so if we think about that, that picture we saw right at the beginning, and um, we might have a child that is looking really resilient, like they're absolutely fine, not affected by things. And maybe they are, maybe they have enough positive relationships and enough buffers around them that they are coping and they are resilient because children and women are very resilient but dig beneath the surface and just check in with them if they are okay and also that sense of being a referee so having to be a peacekeeper so possible effects on that relationship between the adult survivor and the child. So they may come to believe that they're an adequate parent. When I worked in refuge, we had many children who um, would be given over to the care of the perpetrator because this, the adult survivor was just so brainwashed into thinking that she wasn't a good parent by the perpetrator. And but when that happens, it's very difficult to then turn that round. Um, she may lose respect of some of all other children because of what the perpetrator is telling them. She may believe those minimisation narratives that we were talking about at the beginning, that he's just had a bad childhood, he's just stressed, it's because of alcohol, and reinforcing them with the children is dangerous because then that excuses him and kind of puts some responsibility on her for staying, which is absolutely not okay. Um, it should, the, the blame should always be put where it lies. Domestic abuse is a choice. Um, 
the adult survivor may have to change their parent and style in response to the abuser's parent and style. So perpetrators are often very inconsistent in their parenting. They'll go from rigid to permissive. And the the, the mum, the mother then has to kind of adapt and balance that out, which makes that really difficult to be consistent. Um, her ability to manage is thwarted and overwhelmed. So when you're dealing with um, that kind of domestic abuse on a daily basis, um, your ability to cope with anything else other than just managing that um, is greatly reduced. Um, she may use survival strategies with negative effects, so things like alcohol, um, drugs, the bonds of the children might be compromised, and she may get trapped in competition for the children's loyalties, which again is a complex dynamic. So what can you do to help as teachers? Well, what we know from children, and um, this is what children are telling us, um, they want to be able to speak to adults who are understanding about domestic abuse. So adults who have an idea about what domestic abuse is, how it impacts on children, being able to talk about it openly. Sometimes with children, um, we aren't always open with them. We, we want to skirt around issues or we want to be diplomatic or we don't want to risk re-traumatising them. But we want to assume that they're already traumatised to some degree by what they're going through. And actually being able to talk about it openly is the start of that healing process. Like when we talk to children, about what's helped them in their healing process. Usually that thing has a face. It's a person who's asked the right questions, who's listened to them and validated their experiences. So that kind of trust, being able to have someone who's dependable, who does what they say, who will be there when they say they will. Respect and friendliness. Like I think often we don't always respect children and young people as individuals and as equals to us. And we think this is really important if we are able to gain their trust, to have that respect, and also to be friendly, to be fun, to not always be super serious. And creativity and flexibility, so we know that children are able to access healing and um, moving on from and processing experiences when they can do things in a creative way. So we know that for children, things like art therapies, music therapies are much better for them than talking therapies um, or a combination of the two because it accesses a place inside that isn't always just able to be accessed through um, talking alone and also kind of being flexible in our approach. So no two children are going to be the same, even within the same family, they will experience things in different ways, depending on their age and stage of development, their dynamics, the relationship they had with the abuser and with the adult survivor. So being creative and flexible in our, report, our approach to how we support them is a really good way forward. What we have here is a, what we, um, we call a super listener. So this was developed by a group of 27 children and young people from across the, the Women's Aid Network. They came together and talked about the kind of person they would want to speak to them about what's going on for them at home. So we can see some of the things that are important there for them. So things like remaining calm under pressure, believing children, caring and friendly, knows about children's rights, respectful, non-judgmental, can make you laugh, and more, most importantly, can, will do what they promised. So if we can think of all these things when we're talking to children about their experiences, um, and if we can be this kind of positive person in their lives, that will be a big buffer for them um, and a big protective factor. And most importantly, I think when we are talking about domestic abuse, it's important to always talk about how children and adults absolutely move on and heal from domestic abuse when they have the right supports around. And this is a really encouraging um, picture from a young man who's 15 working with the Women's Aid Network that things did get better when he had support. Um, and that's a common experience of children that we work with. And that's, yep, that's me come to the end. So thank you. Thanks so much, Jody. That was really um, interesting and a lot of detail that I think members would be very um, would benefit greatly from hearing about. I thought it was great, in particular, to hear about the different roles or behaviours that children might take on as a as a consequence of living with domestic abuse and how they might not look in in the way that you might think, um, and how teachers might want to pick up on that in their classroom. Um, you mentioned a few times about the asking the right questions. So I thought maybe if you could elaborate a little bit more about what what would those right questions be or some examples of those? 
I think it's about developing a relationship with a child firstly. So you wouldn't ask these things like out of the blue, but when you start to see some of these indicators, like if they are always coming in late, if they are always like tired, if they do look stressed, if they are always feeling sick, and um, some of these things, and um, just asking like, is everything okay at home? Um, are you are you are you worried about anything at home? Um, is anything? Are you, are you scared about anything at home? Um, and I think being consistent in asking these questions, because often children will, will have a sense that they're not to speak about these things, and that this is something that's a secret. So I think kind of reinforcing it's okay to talk to your teachers um, if there was something you're worried about, um, and it's so kind of making that safe space. Thank you. And um, and if a child says that they are worried about something at home. Um, and discloses domestic abuse, what would be the next steps for teachers to take? Well, I suppose it would depend what the, the procedures are within that school. There will be safeguarding procedures. But what I would absolutely recommend is that alongside that, that um, they speak to the speak to the adult survivor and try and get a referral to Women's Aid because Women's Aid children's workers will work with the child out with it doesn't, they don't have to be in refuge to be working with them. They can come into school and work with them. They can work in the community with them. And that kind of support will be really important for them and be able to process what they're experiencing um, and then be able to move on from that and have healthy relationships of their own. Thank you, that's helpful. Um, so I was hoping that maybe you could say a little bit more about what people can do if they have concerns about a colleague um, or, for example, if you are a trade union representative and you're supporting someone who has a high number of absences and you suspect that there is domestic abuse? Well, I mean, I think structurally it's really good to have good domestic abuse policies in place. So if you create a culture where it's encouraged to talk about these things. I think sometimes we we live in a culture where we, we're taught to leave our problems at the door, but actually we come to work as whole people. So firstly, creating that culture where we have an understanding about domestic abuse. We have a, a culture where we're able to talk about experience, our, our experiences. But I think also not being cautious about asking curious questions is important. Um, it might feel like we're being intrusive, but we're not. I think it's so important. This could be a matter of life or death. There's still at least two women a week in the UK being murdered by their partners or ex-partners. It's went up recently. Um, we don't hear about it in the news, but it is still happening. Sometimes people don't really recognise they're in an abusive relationship themselves until someone else can kind of keep chipping away, asking the right questions, um, kind of challenging the beliefs that the perpetrator's given. So, like, if you're if you are noticing things like like they're, they're always off or they always seem stressed. Um, if they, they kind of make comments about relationship with their partner or maybe like a sense that they feel like their partner's career is more important than them, their job's more important, that they're taking on a lot of the, the childcare, that kind of thing, just kind of challenging. Like um, it doesn't seem like it's very equal in terms of what you're dealing with at home. How are you feeling about that? And it can feel difficult to do that. It can feel difficult to ask questions because we, we are taught to don't ask questions, mind your own business. But this is so important. Um, only by asking questions can we maybe have a little chink in the armour of what the perpetrators put into that person. So you're yeah, asking things like, um, how are things at home? It, it feels like you're stressed out a lot. It feels like you're taking on an awful lot. Um, how is your partner? Are, are they helping you out? Um, and kind of think of what the responses are. Um, from that, if they are coming in with like being always tired, kind of saying like, what's going on for you? Um, are you getting help at home? Is there things that you're worried about at home? And again, it, it will feel uncomfortable for us at first, but keep creating that atmosphere because everything might be fine, but likely it's not. Um, and by opening that door up, it's given them an opportunity to, to talk. And we do hear from a lot of survivors that their first person they spoke to was a work colleague. And then they got, eventually after a period of time, they got support and confidence to then re, like get more support from that. So yeah, I think it's really important that we can kind of work through that discomfort. Um, and we might get a response from them that's mind your own business, but believe me, that person will have went away and thought about what you've said. And if you keep doing that um, in little ways, little, just keep chipping away. 
really helpful and yeah as, as you say it, it takes time it's not an over yeah. you know an overnight thing or the first time um the person brings that up um in light of that one observation that i've made is that some domestic abuse policies or quite a lot of them um have it under special leave and say that you get one day in the case of you leaving an abusive relationship and that's the that's the allowance for domestic abuse. I was wondering if you could comment on that in light of that process of, of leaving or not and what that looks like. Yeah, I mean, I think it has been a case by case basis, doesn't it? I think there isn't a one size fits all with us because you could have someone that is able to get their own resources and leave quite easily. They can go, and, not that leaving is ever easy, but they can move maybe with a friend or a family member. But you might have someone that's been so isolated for so long that they have no external supports. So they're having to potentially move into a refuge space that's um, quite a distance from the workplace. They've got a lot of things to organise. And um, there's a lot of like if they've got children in particular, there might be a substantial distance from the children's school now. There will be lots of factors to take into account. And actually that process of then moving into a new property, um, that doesn't happen right away. That can take months. Um, so I think there has to be more of an allowance for I can not, not a determined amount, it's not a specific amount, so one day isn't really going to cut it. They might not need one day in the beginning, they might need five days down the line. So it should be more open to what that person's needing at the time. And informed, that kind of real informed by survivors, what are they telling us they want? Um, there, there'll be that scepticism of, oh, well, they might just say that they, they might just be telling us that they, this is happening because they want more time off work. No one's going to say they're experiencing domestic abuse so they can get more time off work. It just doesn't happen. So it's that thing about believing people, trusting people, valuing our employees as people um, and with trauma um, because they might also need appointments off because they're just really stressed out because they're not used to sleeping because they've been in such a stressful environment and they might be needing to go and get support for that. So are we going to give them time for that? It's about valuing people as individuals and kind of helping them recover from what they're going through. That's really helpful and helpful to remember that there are many barriers to women leaving and some of those involve making you know choices about keeping yourself safe that could involve staying or going back um, and that these policies definitely don't cut it if um, if they don't allow for that level of flexibility so that, that's really really helpful. Um, in terms of uh, working from home and trying to communicate with somebody who might be isolated, whether that is um, a child or an adult colleague, do you have any recommendations on how to do that in a safe way when you have to do it over a video link and the person is in the home potentially with the perpetrator? I would try and speak to them um, at times when you know it will be safe. So if the perpetrator's there all the time, it might be send them an email at work just saying, is there a time that we can chat um, when that will be OK for you? Um, or maybe it might be just talking to them through text or email. That might be safer for them. Um, just kind of taking the lead from them, really. They'll be the best ones to tell you what's, what's going to be best for them. But yeah, absolutely, there is that isolation increased isolation over lockdown with restrictions but I, I would say try and keep that contact up where you know something's happening try and reach out to them by email first and be saying is there a time we can chat on the phone that will be safe if they're then saying no there's not try and keep that quite consistent check in with them by email by text there's a likelihood if the perpetrator is constantly there that the text message won't be safe either but the work email might be a little bit more safe but again take that lead from the person because we don't want to be putting them at more risk either and if it's a child or young person um again take whatever way they're communicating with us take the lead from them but we wouldn't want to be initiating something that we'd want to put that may put them at risk thanks that's helpful um just finally how can teachers proactively be taking action um, to end domestic abuse? Is there anything that they can do, you know, in terms of resources, awareness, anything that you would recommend for people who are interested? 
I think always just um, championing the cause of gender equality in society, but in, in particular in relationships, trying to kind of break down those those rigid gender roles that we have in relationships. I mean, children and young people are subject to so much from the outside world in terms of social media, pornography. So as much as we can do that is going to highlight healthy relationships, consent, um, what equality in relationships looks like. And um, we do find that there's there's more and more younger women coming to us because they're experiencing um, abuse in relationships early on and they're not always sure of what's acceptable and what's not because it's a first relationship. They're kind of thinking, I'm not sure if this is normal. Is this just what it's like? Um, especially if they've not had great role modeling from, from their own parental relationships. So yeah, just highlighting what is a healthy relationship um, about being able to have boundaries, how you can how you can exercise boundaries in all your relationships, whether it's friendships, um, relationships that are platonic, non-platonic. So yeah, I think that's a good way for always be talking about that in a very open way. Um, and there's a lot of resources online. If you go on the Scottish Women's Aid website, we have resources. Um, we've also just launched a web chat for young people on our, um, we, we run the National Domestic Abuse Helpline. Um, there's now a web chat facility for children and young people there who can talk about anything, ask questions, get information. Um, yeah, so there's, there's other resources like videos and animations that um, our young experts group have created that um, are more likely to reach younger people because it is their peers talking to them. It's really helpful. That gives a lot of um, further reading and, and watching for people. Um, thanks so much, Jodie. That was really, really great. Thank and you. Thank you for the opportunity and for having me here.